In the civilized age, we hold to a guns, germs, and steel materialist view of history, but it has long been argued that the main thing our modern views neglect in terms of the motivations, both of ancient and modern peoples, are those born from the ever-present religious instinct of mankind. What can be said of the warrior willing to give his life for the honor code of his gods, or the priest willing to be executed rather than revoke his faith? In the Hyborian Age of Conan, not all gods have power, but all faiths certainly do. This is what is meant by the Thalsa Doom quote, Steel is strong, boy, but flesh is stronger. It is with great appreciation for the work of Robert E. Howard and those who have expanded upon his works over the years that I bring to you this painstaking list of over 40 gods during this time of high adventure. My deepest thank you to Hosov and Nyarlathotep on the Discord for the consultations on the Moruvians and Lovecraft connections, respectively. Please remember that in many cases, theory crafting will be present as much of the information in this universe is very incomplete. In addition, those familiar with Mongoose Publishing's tabletop supplements will notice some differences as we do not do the fusing of minor gods present in that setting. Grimdark. Half off. In an effort to keep things very simple, remember that there are three different soft categories that we can put Conan gods into. The first are divine gods, which can be characterized as human positive figures that belong to a respective unique to them realm of order or nature. So the great bear would technically belong to this. If you want, you can do a fourth category, which would be sort of like shamanistic gods. Again, it's very soft. Shamanistic would be probably in between great old one and divine, but does that really make much sense? Maybe due to age, but that's not really what Great Old One refers to, as we'll get into in a second. The second are demon gods, defined by an anti-human view and their connection to various hell dimensions referred to collectively as the Outer Dark, which all dark magic risks contact with. We went over that in our Guide to Magic in Conan. Last are Great Old Ones, defined by being referred to as either beyond space or time. This can be a reference to Indara, the dream realm of demons in Conan, or Kuth, the star girdle. The dream realm of humans, also called simply the dreamlands in Conan. I'm going to leave it up to you and your headcanon, which is which, as while some are obvious, others not so much. This is just a simple mechanism of your constructing a list of your own to use in the future. These are all very soft, and it is important to remember that Conan is a sword and sorcery, low fantasy, and I have a separate video on the low fantasy nature of Conan, universe. And that doesn't necessarily mean there's not a lot of magic, but rather that there's a lot of mystery surrounding the greater entities in the world that you can interact with. Yes, this is real, but it's real in the sense that it's a known unknown. Also, this is a good time to mention I'm doing a more long form as I go through this script, version of this video, and this is because I'm getting over some sickness, so I want to exercise the good old throat, because this is the first time I've been able to say complete sentences, and it's really fun. It's really great to be able to talk without coughing up a lung. It's awesome. To begin, one of the oldest and most popular religious archetypes that humans have taken comfort in is that of the Sky Father. In the modern study of gods, you may describe this archetype as Zeus from Hellenism or Yahweh from the Abrahamic faith. However, in the world of Conan, this figure is represented by Mitra, also called Ibis by the Stygians and Volca during the Thurian Age. He is often known to work miracles of healing and whose icon is a great bronze statue of a bearded man or an eagle with scales representing law in front of it. His followers have been known to be able to rebuke the wicked with holy power, using it to increase his or her physical abilities in some cases, as shown in Age of Conan. The values of Mitra worshippers are following the law or legalism, humility, poverty, monotheism, meaning there can be no god besides Mitra, and mercy. Much like many faiths today, Mitra followers believe that he will banish the wicked to a hell dimension and that those who live lives of charity and virtue, also assumedly applying to sexual virtue, but will get into that later, will be saved in a kind of heaven. He asks nothing more than you living by his teachings and praying in his name. This should be the most relatable god for those familiar with modern religions. This god was originally spread by the Hyperboreans at the dawn of the Hyborian Age, giving it their name, or giving the age its name, before the downfall of their culture due to the rise of the White Hand. Through the colonization that gives the Hyborian Age its name, it is now worshipped all throughout the Western world and some parts of the Middle East by many different cultures, including the Vendhyans, who are often wrongfully stereotyped when they 
go out of their land as worshippers of Set because they come from the East, but actually they were one of the first cultures to adopt Mitra worship, and adopt him into their pantheon with their god Asura as his father, who we will get into later. Alright, so to really understand Mitra is to understand Robert E. Howard's view of cyclical history, which is that every race, every culture that he talks about, whether it's the Serpent Men or it's a culture of humans, start off building a culture, increasing their intellect, increasing that level of high culture, and then slowly devolve and ruin their own civilization as they become decadent. The entire moral of the Conan universe, whether Conan is involved or not, is always going to be about how your civilization and everything you do needs to complement the natural struggle and growth of life. And as soon as it stops doing that, as soon as you transcend that struggle, you become decadent, and as soon as you become decadent, you no longer have to adapt. You adapt solely for your own pleasure, and as you do that, you devolve into a lesser creature. And the belief he had, and this can be shown in his later character Solomon Cain, who's a very religious Christian Puritan, an ex-pirate, I believe, though I, I could be wrong about that, because I'm not familiar as much with Solomon Cain, but he is a Christian Puritan, and his belief, Robert E. Howard, was that these values existed before the time of Christ and would be recreated throughout all of history. Uh, we, if you want to go a bit further and you want to say, well, okay, wait a minute, it's the Skyfather archetype, you just talked about that, that can also be represented by Zeus and all these other figures, uh, well, those figures were also, if we could dispel some myths about ancient history, um, look up the Lex Scantinia for anyone who ever told you that the Greeks or the Romans were these insane sex fiends. Long before the time of Christian Rome, we can see that they were actually very hyper-conservative and believed in the punishment of sexual criminals to the utmost of the law, which often meant execution. So we can actually see a kind of narrative developing in cyclical history, or at least in Robert E. Howard's view of history that these would be the values recreated throughout all of history, eventually leading to the Christian world, which he had a lot of respect for, through Mitra. So you, you have a lot of guardians who are devoted to Mitra, who are effectively the knights in Age of Conan, but you also have, well, literal knights, Aquilonian knights, who served under Conan, who would have worshipped Mitra, because Mitra is the dominant god of that country. Uh, of course, the philosophy of Krom would become popular after Conan takes the throne. We'll get to Krom a little bit later. But if you really want to understand it, and you really just want an intuitive grasp of Mitra, think cons a conservative interpretation of Zeus or Jupiter mixed with the Catholic, Christian, Roman view. And then you'd have that. You'd have Mitra. Um, it, of course, Ahura Mazda and various other uh, Middle Eastern sky fathers can be used as a substitute here. Ra, of course, would be also something that he would later influence if you want to connect Mitra to his later incarnations in history. But these are the things to think about when role-playing a devout worshipper of Mitra. And of course, you can also have different spins on this. Corruption is, of course, in play, and we'll be talking about that as we get through here, especially next we're talking about Set. So let's get into that. Archenemy of Mitra and the grandfather of the Serpent Men, who are also the archenemy of humanity, is the snake god Set, who is currently also the chief deity of Stygia. Priests of Set, called Tempests, have been able to shapeshift into a visage of their god by turning into a giant serpent. They have also been known to conjure lightning from the sky. If Mitra fills the role of the Sky Father, then Set fills the role of its opposite, the Chaos Serpent or Dragon of Chaos, a monster that, should it achieve its goals, horrible fates will befall humanity humanity. It should be no surprise that this god's grandchildren would enslave humanity for a time, and that it is known as a demon god. Set in some cases is also called Yig in esoteric circles and Dembala in the Black Kingdoms. That should not be confused with Yogg, a cannibal god who we'll get into later in this list. The nature of Set is one that can be described as self-serving, making him a good choice to be the deity most favored by the equally Machiavellian sorcerer Thoth Amon, the sort of sorcerer parallel to Conan's barbarian who eventually becomes the chief religious authority of Stygia. I call him Snake Pope. I will never apologize for calling him Snake Pope. He is Snake Pope. After the banning of the worship of Ibis or Mitra, which he, he does as a Snake Pope. Set favors the practice of sorcery, the gaining of personal power, slavery or death of humanity, and the serpent men inheriting the earth. Future scholars will associate him with the Lovecraftian trickster faceless god, Nyar Lethotep, also called the Black Pharaoh, which also makes him a shoe in to be a great old one in addition to being a demon god. Remember, soft categories, that's why. 
set being claimed as one of his aspects during this time. And so when it comes to, this is a great opportunity to talk about Lovecraft as a supplement versus Lovecraft as a main uh, sort of source, if you will. And that is to say that this is totally different if you view, you know, set from a Lovecraft-centric perspective versus a Conan-centric perspective. You know, something like this, we go down to, I'll say, born, you know, you, you have this thing, born from Azathoth. If we use the Nyar Lethotep lore instead of set being its primary thing, because there are clear aesthetics and clear archetypes associated with set that just aren't associated as much with Nyar Lethotep. Both have a very serpentine appearance, but Nyar Lethotep is meant to be this larger, greater entity. I mean, just reading a little bit of the wiki here. And where Nyar Lethotep went, rest vanished, for the small hours were rent with the screams of nightmare. And so he's just an openly negative deity. And so you can say that on a level that, you know, Nair Lothotep has this element to him that does not favor anyone, but Set clearly has a connection to the Serpent Men, and Set clearly has a connection to sorcerers, and Set is this aspect of Nair Lothotep that's capable of respecting when a sorcerer or a person with a desire for power is genuinely motivated and willing to trick and lie and ste uh, steal and cheat and screw over his fellow man to get that power. He has respect for that and will gift that person with power, especially if they do so in his name. So this is definitely a big difference from, say, Nair Lethotep as being the main source and then we get set from him. I would say use set as the main thing. If you're playing a set-focused character or a Tempest of set, he's not there to worship Nair Lethotep. He is there to worship set. If there are some aspects of Nair Lethotep, and of course I'm not trying to dampen your creativity, if there are some aspects of Nair Lethotep you want to bring into set, I will always, of course, be pro that. But this is just one of the things to keep in mind. This is a god of sorcerers. This is a god that has very ill intent towards humanity to the point where the entire culture, uh, his son Sligeth and his the, the beings that Sligeth created, the first generation of serpent men who are created through the non-consensual form of the sex, and then they inevitably had a species. Because we do see they lay eggs everywhere. They're a species in their own right. They don't have to go out and steal women to make more of them. But the the nature of them. And then there's also Sandy Peterson has a great video on the Serpent Men from the perspective of Yig and from the perspective of what it takes to create Yig. Yig as an entity in his own right over there in the Lovecraft world. So this is just a note on continuity. Set is his own thing. Because Set is his own thing, you want to keep him as the primary focus of your roleplay. I suppose the main thing I'm trying to get at is what's lost when we say Set has to be Nyar Lethotep, is the roleplay opportunity to say Set respects the self-serving. Set is primarily not an entity of pure negativity where everything dies around him, but rather one that is deeply misanthropic. It hates humanity. It wants to deal a death blow to humanity. And within the context of Conan, that is the role set plays. It's not necessarily meant to be, I called him an elder thing previously, I, an elder thing previously, an old one previously. He's actually an outer god, but he's not meant to be the outer god creature that just negatively destroys everything. So. If you want to have the Nyar Lethotep connection there, I would say keep it esoteric, keep it there as a shadowy thing, but really, when, when it comes right down to it, it's your game, play how you want, but this is this is just, ah, ah, da, da, you know? I just, I wanna get that setting right, I wanna get that feel right, and then as far as set goes, it's a misanthropic snake god, not a truly nihilistic outer god. We come now to the ethnic homeland of the famous adventurer Conan, Samaria. Contrary to what those who have only seen the movies may believe, this misty gray weathered land is home to more than just Krom. Much like their western neighbors in the Pictish wilderness, many Sumerians are primitive animists. This means they practice the earliest religion known to man, where all forms of life have souls and everything is a potential god. Most popular among these would be the 
cults of the Great Bear, led by those self-explanatory wise men known as bear shamans. The bear has been used in countless cultures to represent love, protection of family, and might. Blessed with very minor shape-changing abilities, the bear shaman may summon forth the bear's claws, his mystic winds to heal others, or, of course, the physical strength of a bear to defend his home. The philosophy of bear followers revolves around being one with nature, respecting their place in it through the dual-sided philosophy of tranquility and fury. Very straightforward, the tribal bear shaman merely believes in benefiting his tribe or family and destroying those that would harm them. Primal rites or prayers would include induced madness by going into a berserker rage to call forth the might of their god along with using carved bear totems as symbols of their faith. Tranquility for the tribe, fury for the enemies of the tribe, and respect for the cycle of life. That is how the great bear wants you to live. Now, there is a lot to talk about with the Great Bear. Why is this unique? Because look, animism is something very good in the Conan setting. I've said before, there are several Marvel characters that if you wanted to homebrew in the Hyborian Age, you could. Black Panther is easy to homebrew. Panther Shaman, very easy. You can use the Great Bear as a template for that. But with actual Great Bear cults, in history, there actually have been, or maybe there aren't. Anthropologists still argue today over whether the ceremonial, or ceremonially arranged sh shrine-like burials of bear skulls and bear bones constitute a religion of Homo neanderthalensis or Neanderthals. And it's why in anthropology classes today, if you take cultural anthropology, you will still be asked the philosophical question, asked to pontificate upon the philosophical question, were the Neanderthals human? And one of the big things, one of the big differentiations for this, for a lot of people, is did they have a cohesive religion and a religious instinct? That's why it's such a big deal uh, for them. But one of the things I feel like is really great with the Great Bear, and I feel like is something you should take advantage of, it's not something in Age of Conan, but it's definitely great for roleplay purposes, which is creating, and it definitely fits the aesthetic of the bear shaman, but you don't have to be a bear shaman to be a bear follower, of course. You can be a barbarian who's a bear follower, you can be a conqueror who's a bear follower, of course. But have a shrine set up and either it's a gargantuan bear skull like just a big cave bear which is like the biggest creature known to man our relation to these animals if we believe the narrative which we might for this conan roleplay if we believe the narrative that the neanderthals did worship these bears it's easy to see why if your biggest tool is a flint spear you're not going to do much to a cave bear, which is bigger than any bear we know of today, and just like the bear cult, was actually found all throughout the East, Middle East, and West. So there's no reason for you to keep this being a Sumerian thing. There's no reason why bear, because this is partially historical fiction, the Hyborian age is 10,000 BC, there's no reason bear shaman people could not exist in Lemuria or the Yamatai lands. It could not exist in uh, the Middle East. That obviously could be there and everywhere around there. But the, the thing is, it's not hard to see why, because obviously this was the closest thing primitive man, cavemen, knew to a tank. This was a tank to cavemen. That's what it was. And when we think of cavemen, we're thinking of Neanderthals in an academic sense. And, and it's just beautiful. Because in addition to that intense bloodthirsty power, bears have good memories. Meaning that if any of these people, and many of them were wise enough, to learn the behavior and habits of bears and track them, trying to figure out their weaknesses, what they would see is what many grizzly bears do today, which is that they're going to take their cubs to their favorite spots. They're going to exhibit empathy and human-like behavior. So in addition to being the closest thing primitive man knew to a tank, they are also very human and empathetic and sympathetic and even have the ability, when you look at their cubs, to elicit a mammalian cuteness response, which we know is cross-mammalian, so whether you consider Neanderthals humans or subhuman, it does not matter because they would still find the baby bear to be cute. You would find the baby bear to be cute. It would be something that instigates a feeling of empathy and humanity with this animal that could crush your skull. All right, and the last note on the bear shaman is actually this, or the bear follower in general. And that's how bears relate if we're keeping it in Samaria for a Sumerian specific, or even if you wanted to do a bear shaman that was a bit more further north, Vanaheim or Asgard. 
bears show up in Norse mythology, but never as, like, this is the god of bears. There is the king of bears in, uh, in Hindu mythology, which I forgot the name of, but he helps Hanuman become the god of courage. Anyway, it's not important. What is important, well, that is important, actually, for roleplay if you want to do even high in bear shaman, which is very possible. But for a Norse-style bear shaman, bears show up in Norse mythology, but not as a specific god. And this is very interesting because they're always a sign of divinity. And one of the reasons I'm so confident in my understanding of the cave bear as being this big sign of this, like, just it's an intuitive understanding of the cave bear. But the leftover of that is this image of this thing that humans have this inherent respect for that they wouldn't just associate with power. It's important to remember the empathy aspect of it. They associate it with positive power, great power. To be blessed by a bear is a great thing. You are associated with divinity. And that's another reason we can put the great bear in the divine category. A destroyer deity, and easily the god I have the worst grasp on of this list, despite him easily being my favorite god whose worship throughout the practice of soul-warping heraldry goes back to the time before the sinking of Atlantis, is the brimstone fire squid known as Zotli. He is also called the Black Kraken of Atlantis. Described as being beyond the realm of hell and earth, Zotli is without a doubt the first and possibly only in entity related to the dream realm of demons we are exploring on this list, being described as of the Elder Knight. Zotli is also described as being beyond space and time, making him a possible Great Old One, as we are de defining Great Old Ones on this list, which is, I know, a gross generality that throws in other Lovecraftian entities. And the Lovecraft people, I apologize so deeply to you. This is going... I don't apologize because that's bad energy. But it, it's still... It's still a thing. I understand what I'm doing wrong. This is one of the many examples of soft categories being a good idea, as it can be debated whether Marvel's view of him as a demon god or the Hyborian view of him as though like he's some form of unnamed, a great old one, is correct, because it's like it's clearly some mix between the two. He's clearly in that middle ground. This is why in that beginning of the video, you saw the slide. His, his Harold Zotli helmet is in that middle place because you cannot place this guy down. It's so hard. While the powers of his more demonologist followers, such as the conjuration and breathing of fire, are known, the exact tenets of what Zotli wants are not, except to turn you into like a really cool half-demon that you can do in Age of Conan, which is why I'm playing a Herald of Zotli and I'm not regretting it. His heralds are known to be aspects of his wrath when taking on the half-demon form you can find in Age of Conan. Given that this is the part of himself that he chooses to share with humanity, we can assume that much like many cults of Yog sothoth in the Cthulhu mythos, Zotli and encourages destruction. However, there is obvious ambiguity here. Like many old ones, Zotli is a morally gray but negatively affecting humanity figure. Human sacrifice during the time of Atlantis was once done in his name. He likes destruction and favors mighty warriors, while his cults are primarily centered in modern set-controlled Stygia and the Antillian Isles east of the Tropical Tortage. Many of his worshippers, like those of Set, are sorcerers, or more specifically demonologists, specializing in heraldry, which I went over in our Guide to Magic, but heraldry is the fusing of your soul with an otherworldly entity. As a result, he will say that Zotli favors, we will say that Zotli favors destruction, which can be channeled in any direction, sorcery, which can be used for good or evil, and war, which can be waged for any reason. Destroy everything and leave nothing alive. That is what Zotli might want. And we say might want because he is possibly a very, just a very weird creature. He's fr most likely from the dream realm of demons. And I say that because when we talk about the dreams, we talk about the dreamlands, we talk about Kuth the Star Girdle, we talk about the old ones, and we talk about them in relation to Conan, we're talking about the dream realm itself, not necessarily, and this is actually, there is a great, uh, the entirety of the Randolph Carter series uh, for Lovecraft's writings is amazing, and I will always recommend it. It's easily my favorite of his, of his works, all of his stories involving Randolph Carter. But the, uh, the dream quest... You know, we see that this is kind of like a thing where, yes, all these entities existed before humanity, so why do the dream realms exist 
in general in relation to them? Why are they connected to the Dream Realms? The Dream Realms exist as kind of a gateway to commune with these figures, not necessarily the primary place of their residence, but a gateway to them. Where they come from, we don't know. We shouldn't know, because that's the fun of it. Zotli is a very mysterious, but obviously destructive figure. He is, as we said at the beginning of this video, one of those known unknowns. We know he destroys, we don't know why. Unlike Yog sothoth who I did kind of wrongfully compare him to, I would say in the, the script, not fully. There is definitely a relation there, but the difference is this. We only know one conscious thing about Zotli. He wants destruction. We don't know if Yog sothoth wants destruction. We know that Yog sothoth cultists are inspired to end the world. Not necessarily that that's his will. Anyway, let's move on. Now I will tell you something very scary. No one in this world can you trust. Not men, not women, and not beasts, but steel. Steel you can trust. These were the words of Conan's father to his son in the cinematic non-canon version of the character explaining the riddle of steel, the second half of which was explained by that falsa doom quote at the beginning of the video from the same movie, Flesh is Stronger. The riddle of steel is actually fairly simple. Being found on a battlefield and forged from one's will while being used as the primary tool for getting what you want, steel is your willpower or fully developed self. A strong person is like steel. This religion worships self-empowerment through self-improvement. It is not clear, nor should it ever be, whether or not Krom is a true powerful god whose tenets make it so he will never interfere in his followers' lives, or he was merely a myth of a great man who was turned into a god over time after his death. While there have been powerful entities, a storm god specifically, calling itself Krom in the Conan comics specifically to help seal away being such a Shumagorath, this interpretation is still up to you. This could be a prototypical version of possibly one of the incarnations of a Skyfather later who could possibly not be Mitra, but I you know, don't want to disrespect Mitra for this list. You're in the Hyborian Age, your Skyfather is probably going to be Mitra. A more Nietzschean variation or atheistic variation of that would probably be Krom, and a more warlike version of that that we'll get to later would probably be Ymir, kind of a proto-Odin. But anyway... Uh, his followers believe in becoming strong through self-reliance, self-discipline, and self-mastery. If you know this path to be true, then you know that Krom, who lives in the earth, is your god. Followers of Krom believe they will enter a Valhalla-like paradise upon death if they can answer the riddle of steel correctly, effectively being strong in all matters of will to power. With Krom, when it comes to the Conan comics and his representation in the Conan comics, as we did go over, he was also a storm god. So if you also want to look at history and what storm gods were in addition, and that does play into Samaria. Samaria is constantly talked about. It's a misty, cloudy, gray, clouded land of Samaria. You know, it's a land of storms in that way. They have gods of the ocean, who will, a god of the ocean, who we'll get to later, who also blesses warriors and is also seen as a metaphor for magic users. This is a very watery, stormy place. So that works out very well. Again, if you wanted to be a Sumerian purist, a lot of the gods on this list, because the two most fleshed out cultures in all of Conan, easily, are Sumeria... And not Aquilonia. Aquilonia is pretty straightforward. But Stygia. And it shouldn't be surprising, because basically the two main characters of the Conan universe, Thothamon and Conan, come from these two cultures. And while everything else is definitely very cool, these are going to be where a lot of these gods come from. This is why I always feel like it's very important for me to ex you know, express further how these gods can be applied to different places. Especially since we look at the origins of Mitra. Mitra started from the Hyperboreans, and now there isn't a single soul across the Middle East and West of the Conan universe, and possibly the East as well, who hasn't at least heard the name Mitra. It's the, it's the Jesus meme. You, you know the name Jesus, even if you don't go to the church on Sunday. Anyway, when it comes to Krom, it, it, just an encounter with Conan could easily create a cult of Krom worshippers or Krom philosophers who seek, you know, trial by combat and heroism. And there's just a lot of opportunity for a Krom cult to develop. And again, if you want to look at storm gods throughout history, we're talking about themes of growth in terms of crops and weather blessings and things of that nature. So definitely there's room for a more traditional, again, Skyfather archetype variant here. 
where ultimately only by proving yourself through great combat and great self-improvement and self-mastery and getting over vices and becoming a stronger person are you deemed worthy enough to have good weather for your crops or good weather for anything that you require or need. And you will have the blessings of Krom, perhaps. But that would kind of go against a lot of what we see in Conan Exiles. And this is actually something I wanted to bring up as well. Conan Exiles is super inspired by the Conan movies. And that's one of the things people have been vocal about on my videos. And since I'm doing this in a more podcasty format, when it comes to Krom, that's absolutely true. You have two directions you can go with this god. Personally, the way I've always played it, if you've seen What is Canon and Conan video, my What is Canon and Conan video, then you know that I primarily use Howard's initial writings. This is one this is one area where I make the exception and I say that the cinematic movie version is just so much more resonating, it's so much more beautiful and powerful. And while Schwarzenegger did a phenomenal job portraying Conan, the reality is the majority feel of that movie is based around the Riddle of Steel and based around Krom worship. It's easily a beautiful, fleshed-out version of it. It's one area where I just I make that exception. But usually I go Howard, then Lovecraft, then Marvel. And that's just, you know, innovation without violation as long as it complements the themes. We'll get a bit more definitely into that when we start talking about Bor or Thor, Marvel Thor's grandpa in this list. But yep, yeah, that's Krom. I hope you enjoy Krom. I hope you worship Krom. Krom's pretty great. You don't have to do anything to worship Krom. It just means like I hope you do self-improvement. It's it's pretty great. Now we return once again to that land of sorcery and serpents known as Stygia, as well as the proto-Abrahamic land of Shem, to examine the dusky goddess Derketo. Once thought to be two deities, it is perhaps through the power of worship itself that she became one, a goddess of sex called Derketo, and a goddess of death called Derketa. Over time, Derketo merely became her Shemite and Cushite name, while Stygia would refer to her as Derketa. She is often said to be the wife of Dagon in some pantheons, the father of the fishmen, known as Deep Ones, which is very interesting, as this further fleshes out Stygia as a sorceress land where all the dark gods are worshipped freely in a one-for-all polytheistic style, at least in Stygia's current dilapidated, culturally degraded state. However, Durketo worshippers and set worshippers are known to hold each other in social contempt, like a perceived class system where Durketites are viewed as decadent or foolish. She is also referred to as Set's whore as an insult for different reasons depending on the person saying it and the culture they come from. While Durketo might seem enticing to some at first, this primarily Shemite dark goddess has sinister practices associated with it, as is delusionally exclaimed by an insane priestess in the slithering shadow, before I had known fifteen summers, I had been initiated into the mysteries. Those mysteries are the hierarchy of most Durketo worshippers, being led through levels of sexual rituals, often a very, at a very early age, on a path to what they view as enlightenment. If you're looking for a goddess to use in an evil cult against your heroes in a grimdark tabletop setting, I would say you found it. Durketo worshippers value necromantic sorcery, knowledge of all kinds, and of course, hedonistic sex or orgies. When it comes to differences in Durketo worship, the three big questions you want to be asking yourself if you're a follower of this god is, is she a part of a pantheon? What culture am I, am I coming from? Is this the idea? Because we know that the names eventually settled on the uh, over time, Durketo became her Cushite and Shemite name. So if you're coming from Cush or Shem, then primarily you would want to say that she was the goddess of sex, primarily focused on sex worship, but then in Stygia, she would be primarily focused on necromancy. And now we can see how, th because this would be her goddess of death form, which would be Durketa. And this is very helpful, because now we can see where she lines up in the Stygian pantheon. So she can be called Set's Whore here, because they think of, oh, they're necromancers like us, but they do the creepy sex stuff. And of course, the third question is, is there ethics involved here? Are there genuine ethics involved here? Knowledge of all kinds mixed with the practitioner of sorcery. There is ambiguity there for you to change things. One thing that it's good to talk about now, because we're about to get into it with Jebel Sog, is that 
demons in both the Conan and Marvel Universe used to be very physical entities on Earth, at least when we're talking about pure demons, who we don't actually get a lot of chances to talk about here, because a lot of them qualify as great old ones on this list. But when it comes to pure demons, they used to exist as physical entities on this Earth before a series of now extinct or obsolete light gods banished them to hell. And this was a large war that was viewed as a traumatic genocide to a lot of these people. And so when they died, these very human demons became these traumatized, bloodthirsty, grotesque figures, as we're about to see with Jebel Sog, that also has his own origins. And actually, the series Hellstrom, before it got cancelled, which focused on the character of Damien Hellstorm, uh, or Hellstorm from Marvel, did the demon backstory pretty well for Marvel, which is that it was just a huge war, and then everything you know is gone. For Durketto, the way she most likely contextualized this, or the entity that would later manifest itself as the goddess Durketto as humans know it, because obviously we have that cultural history of two deities, we're talking about a, a thing that probably thought the only way to connect to others was through sex, so adding this kind of inherent feeling of trauma and sexual trauma to Durketto herself, or the entity known as Durketto, currently known as Durketto, is something very interesting. But are there ethics involved? Meaning, at least, do they stick an 18-plus warning on your Durketto worship? Is this solely an adult cult? Meaning that, you know, it's easy to take this cult... As I'm trying to find a loophole, because I know you, a lot of you freaks out there, you chose Durketto when you played Conan Exiles because you want to build your sex palace, and I'm trying to find a way for if you want to play a morally ambiguous to, to kind of somewhat good sex cultist, hedonistic sex cultist, how could you do that? That's why I'm trying to lawyer this for you, and I shouldn't be. You're playing a bad guy. You're playing a bad guy. That's, that's the reality of it. But are there ethics involved? Is this a morally gray Durketto cult or a morally black one? And that's what we have to ask. Getting into more of my favorites, as I am a fan of druidism and werebeasts, we come to Jebel Sog, literally the god of beasts, animals, nature, and savagery. If you were looking for a more violent, hunting-focused, aggressive alternative to the great bear, this is it. While the bear's followers may have very minor shapeshifting, the followers of Jebel Sog are often full-blown shapeshifting werebeasts. While keeping their ways to themselves in many cases, the focus of the followers of this reclusive lesser god, this demon god, is uniting all living beings through the language of primal savagery, said to be forgotten by men as well as modern beasts. This can most commonly be done by spreading the curse of their respective werebeast line through their cursed bite. In some cases, they are born directly from a demigod bloodline of Jebel Sog. These men are sometimes werebeasts, but their defining feature is the ability to speak to animals through the primal language. True to the archetype of man's view of canines as a bridge between civility and savagery, which I wrote an entire psychology paper on, the only true common were lines are the wolfman-esque lines of werewolves in the West and the Middle Eastern, more animalistic yet less vicious were hyenas of the Middle East. The third and final way one might learn the primal language is by visiting the Midnight Grove, the realm of Jebel Sog, and proving yourself through battle. But this method at least implies that you are in the good graces of a werebeast or a demigod of Jebel Sog, who again, like we said before, they don't necessarily have to be werebeasts, but they would be a human born with the ability to speak the primal language to unite all peoples by spreading the curse of the beast, or by teaching the primal language, is the goal of these followers. This is very common for demons, as in Conan they were once physical entities on Earth before being banished to Hell. So, when it comes down to, like, like we said before with Durketto, the same way that she knows how to cope with the trauma by spreading sex everywhere, Jebel Sog, in his mind, he sees the banishment, the, this is me theory crafting, of course, he sees the banishment, the destruction, that trauma as the world was divided and divided wrongfully. And this brings the question of, would he extend the primal language to the divine gods? Now, I don't think so. I think being a demon god means you're aggressively against the divine. Uh, that is a possible interpretation, though. But I think most likely it's that he wants the downfall of the divine gods and wants to unite men and beasts, go with what's written, 
he wants to unite men and beasts through the primal language, and this is by spreading the bloodline of the werewolf and the werehyena. And this, these are the only two werebeast lines that I know of currently in Conan. Now, I approve of that personally because it is archetypal. A normal archetypal werewolf story is something like this. You have primal savagery usually symbolized by a full wolf that bites a man, who then becomes an amalgam of man and wolf, becoming a metaphor for the primitive savagery of our ancestors being displayed through us, what happens when civilized man devolves into barbarism. That's the kind of core of what a werewolf story is, and you mix that with what the Middle Ages saw it as, which was this fear of predatory violence, and it's generally the same thing, it just complements it. And the primal language of Jebel Sog, so what is the werewolf? The werewolf in this case, whether you are turned by, and I, I don't even want to talk about the commonplace situation. In this case, deeply, mythologically, archetypally, Jebel Sog himself and his mission to unite people through the primal language is that initial wolf. He is that initial savagery. He is then that savagery put into the civilized person who either becomes a werehyena or a werewolf. After they become a werehyena or a werewolf, we then see them infect others, and eventually all of civilization collapses to this evil monster unless they are stopped by a silver bullet, which symbolizes man's ability to separate himself from his savagery, thus his wolf form and become stronger. And we do know from Marvel canon that silver does work on werewolves in this universe. There is a really great Robert E. Howard werewolf story called Wolf's Head, which is only about an hour long. You can find it on Roland Weifering's YouTube channel. I'll try to link that below if I remember it in my source list. And it's just a very nice world-building device with how Robert E. Howard views werewolves, but it's actually post to the Hyborian Age that we're given this impression, this idea that there were demons who were escaping in, in this figure, King Solomon of ancient history, that were escaping King Solomon his control over demons, and the way they escaped King Solomon was by hiding in wolves. And so, there's this implication that the modern werewolves, werewolf by night in Marvel, even if you were to use the Marvel future as the definitive Conan future in your headcanon, even if that was your future, the reality is those werewolves are still very distinct from Jebel Sog's Hyborian werewolves. The Hyborian werewolves are emissaries of the primal language and ultimately don't have a real choice in the matter. Of course, this isn't really a video on werewolves in Conan or were hyenas in Conan, but if you do want a video on that, let me know below. There is just a lot we can go into, and when it comes to theory crafting, obviously the thing everyone listening to this, as soon as you hear werewolf, you think, why not wear everything else? And that's a good question, and it's something that could easily be put into any story. I don't think it would really ruin the archetypal advantage of werewolves, the soulful advantage of werewolves, that classical interpretation of the myth. The only thing I would say is keep it rooted in actual myths that have existed in cultures. The Hawaiian, the Hawaii sort of were-shark, the, uh, the, the African myths of many were-tigers and, and were-cat folk. I think that would be very useful, and I think that would be very useful because it doesn't violate that sense of predators. And also, we don't see any specific wolf imagery, whether in the more cartoony animated interpretation of Jebel Sog's portrayal, which looks ironically a lot like Hersene. Not ironically, but it looks a lot like Hersene. Hersene is probably a ripoff of Jebel Sog uh, in Elder Scrolls. And then also his interpretation in Conan Exiles, which is this large, winged, lion, wyvern-like creature, which just looks insanely cool, just very metal as a creature, but without losing a sense of druidism and connection to nature. So I, I love that design. But yes, that is, that is Jebel Sog. Pretty straightforward. Go spread the primal language. Having the same relevance for Conan's vampires that Jebel Sog has for its werewolves, we come to a figure that could be considered an evil equivalent to one of the theories of Krom, the Atlantean necromancer turned self-made hemovoric demon Varne. Conflicting reports have him as either a hyper-intelligent man-ape or a full human originally. Varne would volunteer to undergo a ritual among his fellow necromancers to be turned into a powerful demon that could destroy King Kull after his crusade on magic dealt them a heavy blow with the final death of Thalsa Doom in the Thurian Age. Again, that's canon Thalsa Doom, not the 
Falsa Doom from the movies. One of the biggest reasons the Conan movies are non-canon is that the Cole movie uses Thoth Amon for some reason, or characters from the Hyborian Age, and the Conan movies use characters from the Thurian Age, or Cole's canon. It's just a weird thing. He emerged as the first true vampire, with the visage of something between a werebat and a giant ape. Followers of Varney are either vampires or, more commonly, servants to them. They believe in the spread of vampirism to those they see potential in, thinking of them as the chosen ones, these few who will ascend with them to this state of divinity in a way, the teaching of necromancy, and a philosophy of personal empowerment through liberation from mortality through, of course, turning those slain by vampires shall become vampires, to quote some of the comics. Some followers of Varney do not have a choice in the matter, similar to those followers of Jebel Sog, as the turning process has been done to many who are horrified by what they have become. Obviously, these vampires do not know necromancy and would be simply a cursed person of their old culture. There are also insane, half-transformed lesser vampires called Huskies. These creatures are mad, thus, of course, are directly controlled by the will of Varney, who in time, or in the time of Conan, sleeps beneath the waves in sunken Atlantis, scheming and planning beyond the intellectual ability of mortal men. There's kind of a Cthulhu vibe there. The blood is the life for followers of Varney. And this is one of the things, we talked about the archetypal werewolf with Jebel Sog, we have to talk about the archetypal vampire with Varney, and I think Varney fits amazingly for this archetype. One of the big things that has to happen with the vampire is that he's not just parasitic, but he's parasitic in elements where he shows both the savage bestial nature of man and the hyper-civilized nature of man. When it comes to the archetypal vampire, we not only need to focus on the fact that they are parasitic, of course, they're life-training entities, but also that they're not necessarily focused on sex. Sex is the thing that's always brought up with vampires, but we're actually going to be using Professor Michael Kritzer's understanding of the vampire archetype through the American monomyth and the romantic period in which they were sort of popularized. And that is this idea that both the savage and civilized aspects of the creature are demonstrated as being negatively affecting. They, are, they bring about a negative effect regardless of their level of civility and savagery. If a werewolf story is about the lessons of how important civility and community is, a vampire story is about the core of that culture being retained, and without the core of those traditions, usually faith, it's very fitting that this is a gods video that we're doing this archetype in, it's one that will just result in, it doesn't matter how civilized you are, that civilized person will play mind games, they will torture, they will kill, and they will inevitably be just as savage as they were before. And of course, how is this symbolized by Varney? Varney is a giant ape. He is a giant ape figure, who so clearly we have the savagery aspect. He looks like a giant monster. He looks like he's vampire King Kong. It looks amazing. This is a great design. I love the design of Varney. And then when it comes to his civilized aspects, obviously he's a hyper-intellectual sorcerer. There's even a point where the rest of the Ancient Ones, so while Varney is the first vampire and he does seem to have the most control over vampires, he's not the only one to undergo the same ritual. Others do become Ancient Ones or Ancient Vampires in the Marvel canon, but ultimately they'd have nowhere near the same amount of power as Varney. So Varney is the main character here. When they try to command him like he's a beast, assuming the ritual took from him his intellect and turned him more into literally a savage man-made demon, and he is still a man-made demon, or a ape-made demon in this case, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Uh, not really wink, wink, nudge, nudge, it's pretty obvious. But I I even then, he very quickly resists them, slays them, and brings them back to life as his disciples. So it's really kind of irrelevant that these other bloodlines exist, at least during the Hyborian Age. And we also see an example of the cursed vampire, the example of someone who is not a necromancer. In one of the Conan comics, a person from the Black Kingdoms is turned, and they basically end up trying to attack Conan, and there's this sit-down they have, and he just kind of goes over his tragic backstory. So those people do exist in the Hyborian Age as well. A uh, big thing to think about when we're thinking about vampires and Conan is that there aren't a lot of them. They're new. This is a new group. It was like a single cult of necromancers 
plus those who were slain by them and accidentally survived in ways that caused them to become vampires. There are also multiple ways that someone can become a vampire in this world, in this timeline, some through magic, but mostly it's going to be through you were specifically slain by a vampire. And of course, it can't just be that you were, you know, punched or kicked or stabbed. You'd have to be all your blood was drunk by the vampire. And, and that's that's literally it um, for Varne. I, I definitely think there's more we could get into with how to implement vampires. There's always more with theory crafting with these, but that's Varne. Uh, generally speaking, liberate the world through vampirism and heed the will whenever your uh, sort of mind suggest hyper increased intensity mind suggestions from Varne under sunken Atlantis come to you. That is how the followers of Varne do. Now we move back into the far north in the lands of the Vanir and Aesir Nordheimer people to one of the nicer gods on this list despite him being a god of war. Ymir is the father of all frost giants and as the description reads both in the game Conan Exiles and the short story The Frost Giant's Daughter, his only female child is said to resemble a half blonde, half redheaded beautiful woman, basically an unnatural mix between the Vanir and Aesir, each which has the blonde hair and red hair respectively. Uh, the red-headed, beautiful woman scores the battlefield for survivors to lure them to their death to be consumed by her brothers, who have, of course are orc-like frost giants. Ymir is known to curse those who break promises and oaths by turning them into soulless, haunting wraiths in death. Those who are honorable warriors in life and die in battle are known to go to Valhalla. No, not a Valhalla-like place. Valhalla. This is the origin of the myth. When they die. As you can imagine, the main focus of the followers of this religion are keeping your promises, being in good standing with your tribe's laws, and commitment to war or battle. Save for his daughter's escape from Conan's berserk post-war horniness, in which he opened a rainbow Bifrost-style bridge to teleport her away to safety after Conan slew two of her brothers in front of her, Ymir does not play favorites and is not known for performing miracles other than those of battle, through some runic magic, as well as aspect magic, can be done in his name. If you're looking for a good in-between Krom and Mitra, Ymir is the way to go. He will stay, or he will still help rarely, but wants you to do most of the work for yourself. He wants you to follow the law, but is in your corner when a fight breaks out. Ymir is one of my favorites, and by far my favorite frost giant in fiction. One of the things I think we need to get into with Ymir is the idea that Odin will one day slay him. He here's the thing. Bor exists in this universe. He's called Bori, sometimes spelled B-O-R-R-I, sometimes spelled B-O-R-I, and sometimes just called Bor. But he does exist. Thor's grandpa and Odin's dad exists in this universe. And Odin also, if you take the Marvel canon, Odin does not show up in the Conan stories. Odin does not show up at this time period, but he is alive, he is young, young uh, young Odin basically is fulfilling the role where Thor will be. Uh, Marvel's Thor will not be born until about 950 AD, around that time, I believe the, the wiki listed him as 945 AD, and my brain is rounding up. But that's a good way to p talk about why I don't include Thor himself in the Conan world because he's it would literally be a matter of time travel and also the thing about Hercules and Thor is that I hope you don't think it's ridiculous when I say that Conan could probably go on par with Captain America but obviously Thor and Hercules in Marvel are much stronger than Conan so it doesn't really make much sense unless you amp up Conan by giving him his own special weapon I know Savage Avengers gives him a venom sword and also it, it, of course, would be a wonderful thing to have him wield Stormbreaker for a time. That would be really cool in a what-if story. But this is one of the reasons I leave out Thor and the Marvel Norse world. And that's also because going back to Krom, there is that belief that if we stick to Robert E. Howard's original cyclical interpretation of history, rather than going into Marvel's heroic age, it may be possible that, yes, the son of Bor who is Odin, who does exist at this time, he may slay Ymir, as he does in the Marvel canon, as he does in mythology. He may slay 
Ymir that may indeed be indeed be a thing. But Thor does not have to come from Odin. Thor can still be a person who emerges from the Vanir and Aesir people in line more with natural historical mythology. And that is still a beautiful thing. And I would rather that. I would rather the archetype, like we said, like the Ra that would later be influenced by Mitra's image, that would be mixed with, ideally, and I brought up this example before in a different video, where I talk about a heroic Stygian man killing Apep, which is an actual mini-boss you can find in Conan Exiles, but Apep, a older, much stronger Apep, who's become a much stronger sorcerer or warrior, and that being this big hero story that gets fused with this idea of Ibis, which is Mitra's incarnation in Stygia, as Stygia starts to become Egypt, and this idea of history moving forward in that nice, cyclical, smooth way. And so that's why I don't really include Thor in these lists. But when it comes to Ymir, um, yeah, again, this is one of those very straightforward gods. He's wonderful because of that. He's a great design in Conan Exiles. I think the Conan Exiles design is absolutely phenomenal. Uh, it's, it's one of the... I can never really complain when it comes to a lot of these. It, it just is very beautiful to me. The look of it is very caveman-like and... It's very natural and familial, and it, it, much like the Great Bear, it doesn't require a lot of hard lore research to be a follower of Ymir. If you die, your version of hell is becoming a ghost who haunts the mountains, the snowy mountains of your homeland for all eternity, which is either in the Vanir or Aesir homeland. Uh, they worship the same god, despite them constantly being at war with each other, and... I mean, if you know your mythology, you know the Vanir are sadly eventually going to lose, but that's how it goes. Then that's about it. I mean, Ymir is a great god, um, much cooler than Loki, and a wonderful frost giant. I think the frost giant race as it's displayed in Marvel is counter to the cool interpretation of frost giants we see in Conan Exiles, and also the interpretation of frost giants we see in the frost giant's daughter, who are both these kind of orc-like caveman figures that are blue-skinned and ready to slaughter Conan, and it's only due to his superior strength from years of battle that he survives and he's able to slay them. And that is something that I would like to keep the image of. That's another reason when it comes to Marvel's Norse side. We take what we can, we take what's complementary, but we try not to invalidate that. We try not to invalidate that, even when I say... Odin is canon. Well, we don't see Odin. Odin could be canon. Odin could be as part of that cyclical history where he's, again, from the Aesir, and maybe his son is named Thor. Who knows? But that's generally what it is. The, the important thing is to leave everything that comes outside of the Hyborian Age up to interpretation. I know for those who see the word Ymir, they're first instincts like, okay, I know this, I know Marvel canon, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to just, I'm going to throw all that in there. I don't want you to worry about that. I think that in the words of one of my favorite 40k YouTubers, Baldemort, you should always make time for fun, and 10,000 BC is meant to be your time for fun. So don't worry about any of that. Have fun with these concepts. Craft them for yourself. Do not let them be something that holds you back from having a good time if that canon feels, I don't know, claustrophobic, or it's not really giving you the space you need to move forward. History itself is always stranger than fiction, so I would always recommend going with that. Always recommend going with the cyclical history. Once again, returning to the Lovecraftian side of things, we have Yogg, also called Yogg Sothoth. While later in history this deity would have far more civilized nihilistic cult interpretations that seek to end the world through complex schemes and shadow politics, in the Hyborian Age, the primary interpretation of the god comes from the cannibals of Darfar, whose cultural beliefs mixed with the god's perceived will for an end to all things made him into the chief god of cannibalism. More civilized sorcerers who learn the true name of Yogg as Yogg Sothoth may commune with the Outer Dark to further their power, and their cults may resemble those of the Lovecraftian stories. However, in the mainstream, followers of Yogg believe in a strict carnivore diet, eating only meat, and that they must consume human flesh at least once a month on the full moon. A pit of Yogg is dug at this time, and the consumption of flesh of outsiders is highly valued over other tribe members, as it is said to make them immune to weapons. 
Strength and endurance are given in return for the consumption of human flesh in line with the process of ghoulification in Conan and Lovecraft. In extreme cases, eldritch horrors may also be summoned to wreak havoc on the world. Of course, this is shown through the aspect magic in Conan Exiles, which summon in eldritch horror. <laughs> we have a full video on this god linked below should you choose to learn more about its more Lovecraftian interpretation. However, what I'd like to talk with you here about, much like our talk with Set in this video, I'm not here to talk about Nair Lethotep, I'm here to talk about Set, I'm not here to talk about Yog sothoth which is the larger deity. I don't know. In the case of Nair Lethotep and Set, they, they almost are two distinct different entities, with Set being a more minor aspect of that entity. With Yog sothoth it's like Yog sothoth is almost New Testament Yog, and Yog is Old Testament Yog sothoth You know, New Testament Yog sothoth he's running around and he's hanging out with Randolph Carter and telling him how to be a real man, and, you know, it, and actually that is something we will talk a little bit about with the Gate of the Silver Key. There is a nice, I'll talk about that now. The, the, the Silver Key has this nice line, and we'll talk, and you, you'll see that in my Yog sothoth video. But he's using Randolph Carter as this vessel for knowledge for that kind of Darwinist sanity test that humanity always has to undergo. What we've seen here is that while he might be a bit Machiavellian, Yog sothoth at least at this point in history, in the 1920s, you can earn Yog sothoths respect by being a particularly brave human. And we also see, if you're wondering what part of the worship, because I saw this in Executioner's video. He's a, a great Conan YouTuber, and you should obviously go check him out. He has more subs than me, but I hope you still check him out. Uh, which is that he did a Yogg video. And one of the things I think that wasn't answered in that video is, okay, what part of this is Darfar? What part of this is Yog sothoth Well, the lunar rituals are something that carry over into the Dunwich horror. So I will say, the lunar rituals, they come from the worship of Yog sothoth The cannibalism come from the Darfar. But that being said, I don't want to separate these elements. If you're doing Yog in Conan, I absolutely want you to keep those cannibalistic elements. It's one of the things that keeps Yog Yog at this stage in history, during the Hyborian Age. It's just like the question of, well, does this future happen after the Hyborian Age? Does that future happen? No, it does. You don't have to worry about that. That's all in the future. You're here. You're here now with Yog, not Yog Sothoth. Anyway, that's one element. Uh, there's a Darwinist sanity test, which is basically like even if you earn the respect of Yog Sothoth, he still wants to use you as a vessel of knowledge when you exit the dreamlands and go back to normal life to be like, hey, what's up? Would you like to know this forbidden knowledge which might drive you insane? Or if you're a good dreamer, or basically strong willpower, high mana, a natural sorcerer, you might be able to stay kinda sane? The big thing with Yogg is we know in the future Yogg Sothoth mellows towards humanity. I mean, he literally has two half-human kids by the 1920s. So what is going on when it comes to Yog sothoth at this time. Is this the phase where he's mellowing towards humanity? He sees their ability for cannibalism. He sees their ability to, I don't know, please him in that way, be this Darwinist sanity test, and be relatively unchanged. I think personally, when it comes to Yog as a god, not Yog sothoth though we do list him as Yog sothoth during the Tiborian Age, Humanity has not yet proven himself to Yog sothoth Remember that, that quote in the Silver Key, he talks about how very few people he actually likes. Like, he, no, I don't like, it, like it's, I'm paraphrasing obviously, but it's like, I don't like people, I certainly don't like helping people. Randolph Carter, you seem like a good dude. I'm, I, I, you know what, you're actually kind of a guy I respect. Here you go, here's some help. And that's nice, but that just isn't happening as much. And there's this big focus on, and this is what I want to go into here, ghouls. Yog sothoth in his Hyborian interpretation, is begging for an inclusion of ghouls. Ghouls in the Lovecraft and Conan lore are very vague. They are effectively cannibals who undergo a ritual and thus start to become more kind of animalistic, hyena-like. There have been multiple interpretations of ghouls, but they look like very decayed but not undead humans. Sometimes they're very hyena-like, but not really, and we don't want to kind of bring that image in because... 
I think that would be a bit too socially or, or aesthetically confusing with the were hyena. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to stick with the Conan interpretation of ghouls, which I think is pretty nice, this image of what a ghoul is. And I'd like to have cults of ghouls. The Toko Toko people are also an example of specialized ghouls who are like part of a, I don't know, you could say a bloodline and tribe and culture created out of ghoulism and, and cannibalistic ritual. The last note on ghouls as they relate to Yogg as we close this section of the video out is just that there is an inherently religious aspect to ghouls in Lovecraft and Conan because one can be born of ghouls and become human, and it is said that they retain their ghoulish soul, in quotes, so they have the ability to transform back, but so do normal people. Uh, but you can be born a ghoul, raised by humans, and since you eat normal human food, and you live like a human, and you're shown empathy, you become more human, but you can be converted into a ghoul, either as an adult or as a child. And Sandy Peterson actually has a great book on that, or a great video on that. I would say go look him up. Uh, I w I, again, I, if I haven't mentioned Sandy Peterson before, whenever we bring up Lovecraftian stuff, I should. Because one of the things... In this video, I'm focusing all of it from the perspective of Conan. If you focused on, for instance, Yig, as uh, when we go back to set, Yig as a separate entity, you get a totally different interpretation if you're going straight from Lovecraft. And it's important to absorb all of this, but just understand that this is the interpretation during the Hyborian Age. Cannibalism is a great thing to do here, and having a lunar cult of ghouls who worship Yog sothoth and are surrounded by eldritch horrors is a beautiful, beautiful, scary, monstrous thing. You just have, you know, in the center of them, have a Mads Mikkelsen-style... Pickman's model story, which is a good Lovecraft story involving ghouls, where this very human person is, you know, he has an entire family of ghouls living in his house, and he's ghoulish in his soul in his own right. So this was this is something that is very cool, and I, I really enjoy this. I really enjoy the, the show Hannibal is a great way to have, like, a civilized but still savage Yogg worshiper. You know, have someone who is this educated, maybe he's a sorcerer because at this time this is how you would become a healer. Maybe have this educated healer and uh, illusionist, maybe as a mesmerist, and have him just be this like, oh yeah, no, I like people and I want to help others, but you know, I'm going to eat you. What? I'm, I'm going to eat you. Can you please not? Uh, no. Welcome to Flavored Town. In Middle Eastern Zamora exists the spider-haunted city of thieves called Yazud, which is one of many holy places in the nation devoted to the worship of the spider god Zath. Theorized by many to be a reborn version or descendant of the spider god Am, who was the creator of the spider people and enemy of Set, as well as his serpent men offspring. Zath or Am is a god of both magical and military might, blessing those who would sacrifice to him in the form of feeding his manifestation as a giant spider with legions of his young, who will aid them in battle. This can come in the form of the spider people associated with Am, who themselves are talented pirates and craftsmen, or the giant spider children of Zath, who will slaughter all that they see with venomous acidic bomb-like attacks. Worshippers of Zath, including both the Zamoran humans and what would later be the Yamatai spider people, given their lairs in modern Japan, are very unique to their own faction, being enemies of demons, werewolves, serpent men, and harpies. Followers of Zath are effectively spider supremacists who believe that might makes right and that Zath or Am is the mightiest. As one can imagine, slavery, decadence, and sorcery is common among these people, while being subject to a serious amount of continuity conflation in lore between Marvel and other rights holders. The city of Yazud is seemingly named after the oldest myth of Zath or Am of the same name, which also would place him in some circles as a great old one. This should also just show you how messy Conan lore is. It's again, I know I've probably recommended it, before in this video, but what is canon in Conan? The reason I make that video is just to give you a good headcanon aspect uh, for what we can look at in Conan and not getting lost in what comes after the Hyborian Age because that's usually the big thing that I notice people do. There doesn't need to be a definitive time period. In fact, the setting is arguably more free, more open, because we don't know what happens after 10,000 BC because there are so many conflict, uh, conflicting both head cannons and official cannons. In his original myth, Yazud is the wife of Set, 
who is her husband. Believers in this old, duotheistic religion hold that Set betrayed Yazud, nearly killing her, but that she would find a way to reincarnate. This is, of course, complementary to the view of Am as Yazud and Zaf as Am. If one desired a holy trinity of war spider gods, would this would not be hard to homebrew. Now, the reason I include that, now that is actually from Mongoose Publishing. Uh, that view of Yazud as the, the previous incarnation. Now, the reason I include it is it just makes a good amount of sense. Um, Yazud was not previously a god that's being fused in here. It wasn't a separate spider god, so that's a great thing. When you have an opportunity to do something like this, and it doesn't take away from other core aspects. You know, we were talking about that at the beginning of this video, which is that I don't do a lot of the minor god fusing, because a lot of these things, I believe, should be given the space to develop on their own. If they're not well developed yet, that means that homebrews are a thing, that means that you can make a religion using minor gods and have like a unique smaller tribal culture you could homebrew that's always going to be possible in Conan because of the amount of societies that are still living and basically with flint tools and moisture tools. That's, uh, that's the tools that uh, Homo Nathander Thalansis used. But yeah, no, that's very easily doable. The two notes I sort of have in my head on this in general, because again, it's very complimentary. It's one of the rare exceptions. The Holy Spider Trinity is very cool. But we also, of course, have the spider totems from Marvel. So this is the, and I, I understand I'm bringing in Spider-Man to Conan, which is not something I want to do personally. I'm not advocating that your character wear a mask, but spider shamans are definitely a possibility and connecting that to Om, um, Yazud, Zaf, that's very possible. Uh, there is a possible connection to Madam Web from the Spider-Man mythos, which is effectively a woman who is interdimensional in nature and sort of governs over spider totems. Spider totems don't really have any specific value to them. It would be like being the Black Panther in Conan, which we talked about previously, as well as being the you know bear shaman. But that would be very useful. That would be an alternative path if you were looking to do spider powers without, or spider strength and speed, yada yada, without the connection to Zath or Om. Um. And the, the real thing, the cool thing about the connection to the spider totems is obviously it would have to be a homebrew, but Spider-Man Noir already is a great template for this. This is an alternate version of Spider-Man who lives during the Great Depression. It's actually somewhat Lovecraftian, somewhat detective-like, where you, oh, Spider-Man Noir, detective-like. But basically, it's a magical version of the spider powers, and while I definitely wouldn't want the full spider powers to be given to your character, because it's a lot like the Venom symbiote. Like, the Venom symbiote is very complementary to the Conan setting, and even has a story arc in the Hyborian Age in Savage Avengers. That is, that is a thing. It's very cool. He was tortured by an evil sorcerer and wants to get revenge on him, and meets Conan time-traveling through the world in the modern age, and gives him a Venom sword. You want a Venom sword? I want to kill this sorcerer. Let's, let's team up. That sounds cool to me. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's schlocky, but it's fun. But generally speaking, even if it's complimentary, you will have to depower it for the time period. Uh, maybe not as much as you'd think, but like say one-fourth of the usual Spider-Man level power would be possible. I think that would be very fun. And of course, no web slinging, or maybe you can decide for yourself if wall crawling is a thing. I don't, I don't think there's a reason to do spider totems if wall crawling isn't a thing. I think you should do wall crawling. And there are several magical characters like that, which are very fun. I hope you look that up. Th there really is only one more, and that is Nancy. Nancy is a very fun trickster spider god from Africa. Africa, and so adding trickster elements to Zath, to Om, to Yazud may be fun. And I, I don't know, Yazud, Zath, and Om all come off as very conquering gods. They do not come off as trickster elements, but if you want to add a trickster element, that Anansi element, that might be good for that spider shaman aspect, but also if you want to say that there was already, you could say that Anansi was a new god, and you could say that you were worshipping them as the fourth incarnation, because this is a god who incarnates as the fourth incarnation of Yazud, or the you know, second incarnation of Om, which, again, if you want to keep the Trinity aspect. 
But I like that idea. I like that idea because Anansi, you, you could have a four elements thing. So the Mythic Four archetype is very fun if you wanted to include the later real life god of Anansi. So you have Yazud, who initially sets up everything. And with the Mythic Four archetype, you have Earth, which usually represents common sense, uh, building, growth, and survival in that area. So Yazud, so they, they're associated with the city, so you could associate them with common sense. And then you'd have Om, who is easily the most emotional of them because he created spider people with deeper emotions. And so that's water. Water is emotion. And then you have the... Uh, Nancy would definitely be... Well, a uh, little later. But then Zath. And Zath is just straightforward, bloodthirsty, out for war. Here's like savage spider people. So he would be fire. He would be a trailblazer. Just there for bloodshed and war. And then you would have... Air, air is new ideas. That would be a Nancy. You could jurymander the trickster element in a very jurymander. You you could fuse the trickster element into your pantheon in a very natural way. So Spider God, Spider Pantheon, Spider Man, Spider Time. It's your time if you like the spiders to worship Zath. Go do it. All right. While this project is fun, this will make part one in our some odd part series. The way I think I'll chop this up is trying to do at least 11 gods per video. I'm not really sure what we could call this. We could call this the popular gods, I suppose. That would be part one. This was the popular gods. And next time we're going to start to get into the less explored ones or the ones that aren't in the mainstream so much when you think of Conan. You know, we covered ones that help you think of Conan Exiles and Age of Conan apart from... The inclusion of Varney, I believe all the gods we covered on this list so far have simply been game-featured ones. Next time, we'll be starting off with Man and McLear, going into eventually Jill, Ishtar, and hopefully by the end of part two we might get to Bakrug, because that means I'll have completed my initial list of gods and we can move on to extra gods outside of the realm of just Conan. You know, we can move on to the fates from Elric, and we can move on to many of the Marvel gods that existed in the Hyborian Age or before then, and we can move on to that. Though Agamotto is eventually on this list, as will be the Vishanti. At any rate, I hope you enjoyed this part one. I hope you tune in for part two. This was a much more casual video for me than I usually do. Usually I like to keep things scripted. It was originally done this way because I really needed to test out my vocal cords because I am recovering from sickness. The other reason I did it this way is simply because I would need to talk out of character about many of these gods. It, there were certain things that were left unclear in my guide to magic because it was all done in character. As we said, please tune in next time for part two.